It began simply enough. It began with a phone call, a phone message, actually. Dave came home, and the message light was blinking, so he picked up the phone, the cordless phone, and that part's important. He picked up the portable phone, thinking maybe it was Morley. He was walking around the kitchen with a phone to his ear the way you do when you're a bit keyed up, flipping through the mail, opening the fridge, pacing into the living room, over to the kitchen window, not really paying attention to the phone. And that part's important, too. That part is maybe the most important part, if that is you're interested in the archaeology of the infamous events that unfolded at Dave's house several weeks ago. If you're interested in sorting out the spaces between cause and effect, the fact that Dave wasn't totally paying attention is key. Because it wasn't Morley who had left the message Dave was only half listening to. It was Dave's arch nemesis, his neighbor from two houses down, Mary Turlington. <laughs> now, Mary had called and left the message just before she and Bert left town. And it's important to know that, too, that it was a Friday night that Mary called and said, we're going away for the weekend, but we're having a dinner party next Saturday, and we'd love you to come. And Dave was thinking as he paced that he'd rather have his legs waxed than go to another dinner party at Mary Turlington's. <laughs> and that's when things began to happen too fast. Things that caused Dave to lose his focus, such as it was. Dave was in the kitchen, sort of listening to Mary Turlington's message when all hell broke loose. Morley blew through the back door with her arms full of groceries. Sam blew through the front door with two friends. The cat, well, you know what? You don't need to know all the details. <laughs> you just need to know that things got pretty confusing for a moment. And Dave, who wasn't really paying attention, hung up the phone, or meant to hang up the phone. And this is the crucial moment. This is the moment where he thinks he hung up the phone. But what happened was he pressed the callback button. <laughs> Which means instead of hanging up, Dave called Mary Turlington. <laughs> or more to the point, Dave's phone called Mary's message machine. And Dave, who was holding the phone in his hand, waving it in front of him like a microphone, said to Morley, who was unloading the groceries at the counter, Mary Turlington's invited us to a dinner party. And he dragged the words out derisively as if Mary had invited him over to deworm the dog. <laughs> but he didn't stop there. He kept going. She said there'd be interesting people, which means there'll be name tags, which means she decides where we sit and there won't be enough food. There's never enough food. And she never opens the wine anyone brings. Which is true. She doesn't. The Turlingtons serve Bert's homemade wine. And Bert's homemade wine tastes like car wax. And he didn't stop there. Dave kept going. Dave said, I'd rather have my legs waxed than go to another party at the Turlingtons. And that is when the phone beeped. Twice. Dave looked down at the phone in terror, realizing what he had just done. He had just left Mary Turlington a message. <laughs> he had just told Mary exactly what he thought of her invitation. And when the enormity of what he had done became clear to him, Dave began to rock back and forth. He stood there staring at the phone, rocking back and forth. Morley stopped what she was doing with the groceries and watched him. And then when he began to moan softly, she said, What now? Huh, said Dave. Right, said Dave. Oh, said Dave, trying to pull himself together. Oh, said Dave, reassembling himself. I, uh, uh, I really don't think I want to go to Turlington's for dinner. <laughs> Get over it, said Morley. <laughs> right, said Dave. Get over it. It's nothing. I'll get over it. It's okay. But it wasn't okay. And Dave wasn't about to get over it. And it certainly wasn't nothing. It was something. And Dave knew he was going to have to do something about it. The potential for gossip was just too horrible to consider. If Mary heard the message and if the story got out, and who was he kidding? Of course the story would get out. 
Even Morley would be telling the story once she heard it. <laughs> Propelled by the universal, indisputable, undeniable drive that all women share. The dreaded urge to tell other women embarrassing stories about their husbands. <laughs> Mary and Bert were away for the weekend. Dave had 48 hours to get into the Turlington's answering machine. 48 hours to erase his message. First thing that came to Dave's mind was that he had to get his hands on the Turlington secret code. If he could intuit their PIN number, he could get into their message service and erase the message. He wasted the first half of Saturday morning trying to ferret out the year that Mary and Bert were born. No one seemed to know though everyone wanted to know why it mattered to Dave. So he gave that up and he tried to dial directly into the system, planning to plug in numbers at random. 1958, 1959, the Turlington's twins names, whatever. But he couldn't find his way in. The Turlington's didn't seem to have a message service. And that's when Dave remembered. The Turlingtons didn't have an answering service, they had an answering machine. It was one of those merry things that made Dave crazy. It's way cheaper, she said dismissively the night Dave spotted the old tape machine in their upstairs family room. For the first time since Friday night, Dave felt a flicker of hope. He didn't need a secret code. He just needed to get into the Turlington's house. If he could get into their house, he could erase his message with a push of a button. Dave waited until dark. <laughs> he circled the Turlington's house, starting in the backyard, shaking doors, pushing on windows. The Turlington's house was locked up tighter than a bank. Trust Mary, muttered Dave, his hand on the front door handle, shaking it desperately which is about when he spotted Polly Anderson watching him from the sidewalk. <laughs> no one's home, said Dave, trying to pull himself together. All the doors are locked, said Dave. And then he dropped his voice an octave and said, I was just checking the security. There's no way in. And then he said, shut up. Shut up. He'd intended to say it silently to himself. <laughs> it was supposed to be a personal order. But Dave was so wound up, he barked it out loud. Polly began to back away. It was half an hour later, wandering through the park, the dog by his side, the empty swings hanging glumly in front of him, that Dave had his brainstorm. He was whistling when he came home. What are you whistling? asked Morley. Dixie, said Dave taking off his jacket and throwing it across the room, watching it float above the easy chair like a big black bird, falling under the arm perfectly. Bingo, said Dave. Magnetic recording tape, the kind in the Turlington's answering machine, is essentially a ribbon of microscopic iron filings. Now, when you record something, say, for instance, a phone message, the tape recorder organizes those filings on the tape into a recognizable pattern. If you want to erase what you've recorded, you just have to pass the tape over a magnet. The magnet returns the filings back into a random pattern. If Dave could get a magnet, and if he could get the magnet into the Turlington's house, he could erase his message. Heck, if the magnet was powerful enough, he could, hypothetically, erase the message from outside the house. <laughs> hypothetically. He tried a building supply store the next morning. They didn't have the kind of magnets that Dave was imagining. This'll pick up 200 pounds, said the guy at the counter. Stronger, said Dave. Not here, said the guy. Try a scrapyard. They have magnets strong enough to lift a car. The scrapyard guy had to lift his head to look at Dave from under his greasy baseball cap. When Dave told him what he wanted, the scrapyard guy, Steve, or that was the name stitched on his blue jacket, Steve lifted his head and squinted at Dave. Then he walked away without a word. 
Dave wondering what he was supposed to be doing until Steve motioned with his head, follow me. Dave followed him into a dark and dirty back room, a room piled with old engines and car doors and stuff that used to be something but wasn't anything anymore. The guy pointed with his head at a device the size of a waste paper basket hanging from the ceiling. Like this, he said. Exactly, said Dave. Could I borrow it for a couple of hours? I'll pay you. Seventy-five dollars, said the guy, and you have to have it back by closing. When do you close, asked Dave. The guy started to laugh, and the laugh became a cough, one of those disturbing, raspy fits that you think is never going to stop. You think the guy's going to die right there in front of you, his belly hanging over his belt. Dave thought maybe he should get the guy some water, but then the guy stopped coughing and spat on the floor and said, we never close. He was shaking his head again. And then he reached up and pulled a, a rusty chain pulley and he lowered the magnet. You have to be careful with it, he said. I can handle it, said Dave. Guy gave Dave a close look from under his cap. I better show you, he said. He lugged the magnet into the shop and he set it up on the counter, waist high. And he unwound an extension cord and turned to plug it in. And as he did, Dave was thinking he should show this guy that he knew what was going on. So when the guy turned around, Dave was flicking the switch to turn the magnet on. <laughs> and suddenly, this guy, Steve, or whatever his name was, this guy who had barely said a word, this guy who had hardly moved when he moved, suddenly, slow-moving, say-nothing, scrapyard Steve exploded. No! He shouted, jumping back, his arms flying down to protect his waist. <laughs> huh? said Dave. Now, there are many fundamental laws of physics. The magnet only knew one of them. The magnet only knew the law that was in its nature to obey. The law about magnetic fields and the forces of attraction between opposite poles. Like, say, an electromagnet, and a belt buckle. <laughs> Dave's. <laughs> Dave flicked the magnet on, and slow-moving guy behind the counter threw his arms to his waist and said, No. <laughs> and then it's hard to remember exactly what happened next, <laughs> except the magnet flew off the counter. Dave would later compare it to a wolverine. <laughs> because it flew towards him viciously. There was a whooshing sound as the magnet smacked into his belt buckle. And all the wind left Dave's body at once and his knees buckled and he sank to the ground, pawing at this thing drilling into his groin. Dave, dimly aware of slow-moving guy hovering over him, wheezing and coughing and spitting, <laughs> wrestling with the magnet, trying to get at the off switch, as Dave lay on his back like an upended turtle. Later, Dave would try and explain it away. It was a sucker punch, you'd say. <laughs> In any case, when he got off the floor and regained his wind and brushed himself off, Dave had to convince the guy that he could handle this thing. It was a close thing, $75 rent and a $400 refundable deposit. Just bring it back, said the guy, smirking. Once he got it home, Dave decided he'd better try out the magnet before he hauled it up the ladder for real. He had jury-rigged a carrier that he was going to use to get the magnet up the ladder to the Turlington's den window. He had it on one of Sam's backpacks, which he was going to wear on his chest like a snuggly. He had removed his belt and his watch. He had emptied his pockets of everything. There was zero, none, no metal on him at all, not anywhere. And there was no one home at his house. A good thing. He went into his kitchen and he switched the magnet on. There was a high-pitched electronic sort of hum, but nothing dramatic happened. And Dave smiled. I can handle this, he thought. And then he gasped in terror. 
because out of the corner of his eye, he spotted flying across the kitchen towards his chest a carving knife. <laughs> Blade first. Dave twisted at the last moment, and the knife flew by him and stuck in the kitchen wall. But now he was facing the stove, and a cast iron fry pan was making menacing movements. He spun around again, and cans started sailing out of the recycling bin. Cans hitting him in the chest, attaching themselves onto the magnet and then onto each other. And Dave twisting around, twisting and twisting, and things flying around the kitchen. Dave fumbling for the off switch, lunging around the kitchen, trying to reach his arms around the growing layer of tin cans, slotted spoons, pots, and pan lids that festooned his torso. He looked like a piece of modern art. It was 6 p.m. when he propped the ladder against the Turlington's house. He hitched his beltless pants up and he gave the ladder a shake to make sure it was secure. He was pretty sure he had taken care of every variable imaginable. He went over it in his mind one last time. There was absolutely no metal on his person. No belt, no pens, no watch, nothing. Unlike the kitchen, there was no metal in the vicinity either. Nothing loose anyway. He had borrowed an old wooden ladder from Carl Lobier. He started up the ladder, playing out the extension cord behind him. He looked like a ghostbuster. <laughs> and when he got to the top, he braced himself in position in front of the Turlington's den window. He looked around one last time. He took a deep breath. He shut his eyes. Now, he'd already been up here twice without the equipment. He had checked the window frame. It wasn't metal. It was some sort of polyvinyl plastic. There were no overhead wires. He had thought of everything. He flicked on the magnet. He had thought of almost everything. <laughs> Mercifully, things happened so fast, Dave had no idea what happened until it was over. He only knew that when he flicked on the magnet, he flew off the ladder, <laughs> flying through the air like he had a jet pack on his back, <laughs> flying and flying until he smacked into the side of the Turlington's house and stuck solid, <laughs> attached to the Turlington's drain pipe. He was a good... 15 feet above the ground, arched backwards like some sort of hideous marsupial, all arms and legs and drooling horror. His beltless pants dropped around his ankles. Of all the moments for Polly Anderson to come to feed the Turlington's cats, As Dave was hanging from the drain pipe, wondering what horrible thing he could have possibly done in a previous life to have deserved this, Polly Anderson was coming down the driveway with raccoons on her mind. Polly is terrified of raccoons, and she had spotted one the night before when she had come to feed the Turlington's cats, and Polly was on high alert. So when she walked directly under Dave, and Dave's pants finally slipped loose, and landed on her back. <laughs> Polly thought she had been jumped by a raccoon. <laughs> she lifted off the ground and she screamed. She screamed so loud that lights began to flick on all over the neighborhood. <laughs> and there was Polly heading down the drive, Dave's pants flapping around her head, <laughs> Polly batting at the pants with her hands until she stopped abruptly and untangled herself and looked up. And all Dave could think was, of all the days to have put on the white boxers with the red Santa and the prancing reindeer. And all he could think of saying, hanging there upside down in his boxers, was, Hi. And then, then without thinking, 
he switched off the magnet. <laughs> Jim Schofield arrived just as Dave hit the ground. Jim took the keys from a shaking Polly Anderson and said, you go home, I'll deal with this. He didn't say anything as he helped Dave up and waited for him to regain his wind. Ever since witnessing Dave in the Plaza Hotel lobby with a raw turkey under his arm, Jim doesn't ask about Dave's private life. And he didn't comment when Dave followed him into the Turlington's house. I, I need a drink, said Dave. And Jim didn't notice him slip upstairs into the den. Dave didn't have time to work out how to erase the messages. Instead, he opened the answering machine, thinking he'd take the tape home and erase it at home and return it later. There were, however, two tapes in the machine. One was for the Turlington's greeting, the other was to record the incoming messages. There was no way to tell them apart. So Dave grabbed both tapes. Before he left, he unlocked a window at the back of the house so he could get back in. It was after 10 when he squirmed through the window with both tapes in his pocket. He was in and out as fast as he could, locking the window he came in through and leaving by the back door, locking it too. He only had one last thing to do. He hadn't erased his message. There were other messages on the tape, and he, he decided he shouldn't ruin them. So instead, he had queued up the message tape at the beginning of his message. All he had to do now was go home and phone the Turlingtons and record over it. And he ran home, and he gathered himself up, and he dialed the Turlingtons' number, and the phone rang once twice, three times, and he heard the thump and whir of the message machine picking up just in time, too, because out the window he could see the Turlington's car pulling into their driveway. <laughs> and as he watched, Mary Turlington walked up her front steps with her keys in her hand, and then the Turlington's recorded greeting began. And this time Dave was paying attention, thinking that if he had only paid attention the first time, none of this would have happened. Except it wasn't Mary Turlington's voice he was listening to. It was his voice. And he was saying, Mary Turlington has invited us to a dinner party. And he dragged the words out derisively as if Mary had invited him over to deworm the dog. David reversed the tapes. He had put the tape with his offending message in the greeting slot, and until someone changed it, everyone who phoned the Turlingtons would be greeted by Dave. And he would be saying, there will be name tags. She will decide where we sit. There won't be enough food. There's never enough food. She never opens the wines anyone brings. And he doesn't stop there. He keeps going. He says, I would rather have my legs waxed than go to another party at the Turlingtons. Dave began to rock back and forth. <laughs> oh my God, he moaned. Oh my God. Thank you very much. Thank you.